Show, the free range human show of choice, your daily dose of reality radio. It is hour two. We are live here in the Mack Hike of Flowood Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram Studios. If you're out car shopping today, get by there and see them at Mack Hike of Flowood up to $10,000 off select models and they are the home of the $399 car payment. This segment is going to be brought to you by our good friends over at Guns and Gear, the sponsor of our phone line, 769241. I'm sorry, the sponsor of our text line. And that number is 769-241-1944 if you want to get by. Or if you want to text the show, that is the number to do it. Guns and Gear, uh, you can get by and see them at Highway 51, on Highway 51 North in Gluckstadt. That's 1716 Highway 51 North. You can shop them online at gunsandgearms.com. I can't think of a better place to go spend some of that Christmas dough all of you got, especially uh, those stocking stuff for money, some of those gift cards. Go out there and see them at Guns and Gear. Uh, you can shop them online, Guns and Gear MS, or again, just go in the store. Let them know you heard it on the Clay Edwards Show. They're the home of No Limit Ammo. They got all your favorite guns. They offer, also offer Cerakoting and gunsmithing. So they are your one-stop shop right there in Madison County in Gluckstadt on Highway 51 North. That's Guns and Gear, the sponsor of the Clay Edwards Show text line. All right, it is our Testimonial Tuesday you know, I told you guys we weren't going to stop doing this. Uh, sometimes I screw up my scheduling, and I book different stuff on different days, or the radio station books stuff, but neither here nor there. In the studio this morning, I've been looking forward to this one since I started booking these. We've got Miss Robin Mabry joining us. Robin, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I am good, good, good. All right, so how was your Christmas? Man, it was amazing. Just slow with the family, having some just time with my daughter and new grandbaby that was two weeks old so it was a fabulous christmas well good deal all right so i know we got a lot of content to cover we do so we will stop with the pleasantries and we'll just jump straight in Uh, tell people a little synopsis here what led you to giving your testimony and kind of start at the beginning i mean we'll go from there Yeah, so uh, you had put out there about Testimony Tuesday on Facebook, and and I had been kind of following you along. My husband listens to the station, listens to your show, and um, you had said, hey, would somebody be interested in sharing uh, the other side of the story with addiction? And recovery and um, the, the family, family the, side, the family side, family the, side, the victimless it. crimes, right? The victim, right? And so I was like, man, families are never given the opportunity to really share their side of it. You always hear the victory of the addict overcoming, but you never hear the family side of it. And I was like man, I'm going to reach out. I just got to. So I reached out to you, and that's why we're here today. Yeah, I'm going to tell you, one of the best shows that we've done yet since we started doing this was uh, Brad Burleson. He is the he's the brother of a addict who died. Him and his uh, wife died, both from, from basically a bad pill, you know, t- a year apart. And uh, it was one of the most riveting shows I'd ever been a part of because it just really hit home because – I was like, man, that could have been my family having to plan my funeral. And I was was really, really glad I extended the olive branch and decided to tweak this just a little bit to get uh, the other side of it. So pick up. Tell folks what led you down your journey. So um, my whole life, there's there's not a part of my life that hasn't been touched by addiction. Um, I grew up in Texas. And both my parents were functioning drug addicts and alcoholics. Um, I grew up in a crazy environment. Um, I didn't realize I really had PTSD until uh, probably four years ago um, from my childhood. Just hadn't dealt with it. You know, we talk about that a lot on this show about people, uh, children growing up in these high poverty, high crime areas that it really does have to cause some type of PTSD on them. And, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of a no apologies person here when it comes to certain things. Still no free pass to go out and commit more crime and stupidity. But it does make them a little different, man. You know, just the, the, what, it, what that has to do to the psyche of growing up in a, in a home with an addict or in a 
high crime area where people are getting killed on the corner every day. I mean, it's just going to be different than the way I grew up. Right. And so my thing was um, I started like there's a whole part of my childhood that there was a gap that I don't remember. And I'm like. I can remember when I was this age, but I can't remember like a four year span of my childhood. And I'm like talking to my mother, you know, now, and she doesn't really remember because she was high and out of her mind and all of that. And I'm like, and so I started realizing that I learned to disassociate as a small child. And I, anytime things got stressful and I could feel it, it like, amping up inside of me I would just feel like I was kind of out of my body and I was observing things from outside and not inside and um, so those were some clues of my childhood and growing up in that and then I ended up uh, falling in the same pattern and using drugs myself just to cope with the pain and the trauma and the PT. I didn't know any other way. It was just what was shown to me. This is how you deal with your issues, you know, <laughs> and you I drown them, drown them, drown them, numb them, whatever mm-hmm. you have to do. So I did that until I was 27 and um, I found the Lord or the Lord found me and I got saved and uh, he started healing all those places inside of me. And uh, I just had no reason to use any longer. So I wasn't an addict. I was just numb in pain. Mm-hmm. And when Jesus came in and healed all of that, like I had no reason to use anymore. You know, for folks out there listening right now, I hope y'all are soaking this in, especially if you are still using or if you're an alcoholic or whatever the case may be. And you've got children in the home. This is what they, they see what you're doing. You know, they may not understand it right now. But as they get older and they start processing things and they start understanding, oh, I was watching mommy and daddy get high. I was watching mommy and daddy stay drunk. That's kind of, you know, we talk about generational poverty. Uh, generational addiction is no different. You know, they, they, we are products of our environments. And it was generational. My grandfather was a Southern Baptist preacher and he was an alcoholic. My mother was a preacher's daughter, and she wanted out of that house as soon as she could. She got pregnant with me when she was 15. And so uh, just to see it passed down from generation to generation, and even my daughter struggling. My, my son doesn't struggle, but my daughter's from my first marriage, and he, I was married to him, and we were both. I was a drinker, and he was a methamphetamine user. And we divorced when she was four and just a product of environment. She ended up going down the same path. So we went from generation to generation to generation. And my son is from my marriage now. And at that point, the chains had been broken off of me. And he was raised with a mom that was sober. And so he he doesn't struggle with addiction. Um, But my daughter is coming out of that. How long has she been in, in, in that? Had that? How long has that grip been on her? Um, she's 29, and it started when she was 14. Yeah, so better part of her life. Yeah. Her adult life. Yeah. Teenage and adult life. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think I really, for me, mom probably started just dabbling with alcohol, you know, running up and down McDowell Road and all that stuff, having a good time as a kid and growing up in Jackson in the 90s. Yeah. Um, started just drinking, you know, until I was 15, 16, 17, a little marijuana, you know, I, I'm, I'm a supporter of all this marijuana stuff. I don't; it's not my thing, but I'm a supporter. But I will say that um, marijuana was a gateway drug for me, not because I'd smoked marijuana and then thought to myself, "Oh my God, I, if I don't get a line of something, I don't know what I'm going to do." But it loosened up those inhibitions to say you grew up with reefer madness and thinking if you smoked weed, it was going to kill you. And I realized that it didn't kill me. So everything they said about weed was a lie. And then I said, oh, well, everything they say about cocaine must be, everything they say about pills must be a lie. Everything they say about methamphetamine must be a lie. Those things will probably all make me feel good, too. And so what I tell people was a gateway. It was a gateway to loosening up my inhibitions and learning that everything I'd heard about it was a lie. It's like, well, that was a lie. Why wouldn't this other stuff be a lie? I bet it's good, too. Why don't they want me to have that? Right. You know, it kind of took me down there. I got a little off off the, uh, down a rabbit hole there. But my mind started early, too, and I was 34. You say your daughter's 29 now. I was 34 before I really, 33, probably. I was sober a year without a job. So, yeah, 33, and then I spent a year sober before I got into the car business and stuff in 2011. And so it stunted my growth. 
mentally, professionally, yeah. physically. Now I was making good money because I was in the nightclub business and f- kind of had a cash cow, but that was it wasn't doing me any favors. Right. So to say all that to say your daughter at twenty nine, she still has her life in front of her. So right. like the whole thing, hit the reset button. You know, uh, I, I like for my story to at least be a story of people to say, if he can do it, I know I can do it. You know, yeah. and they, they just got to work hard, got to show up every day, got to decide that's what you're going to do. And uh, just do it. Every got to get up every day. And do yeah. It. And, and you can do anything you want. So my my husband that I'm married to now, we've been married for 23 years. Um, when we met, we were both actively using, um, he, he had a different drug of choice than I did. I, you know, both of us were smoking weed and partying, doing bar scenes, all that. We met in a bar. Um, he come from a really good family, been in church his whole life. Like, you know, the typical Southern, um, Baptist story, you know, um, come from a good family and, they were like, y'all need to go to church. Well, I went to church with them, and I was like, I really ain't into this church thing. I wasn't raised in church, didn't know anything really about any of that because my mom didn't want any of it in the home because of her dad. And uh, so I end up going to this church, and the pastor of the church has a huge heart for uh, rehabilitation of those in addiction and that's my church out there Hickory Ridge does too yeah. with uh, Terry Fant and that crew and they, they're very arms wide open to people at rock bottom yeah so um, our pastor ended up birthing Mercy House Teen Challenge he kicked it up got it started Pastor Wilson and um, so that's kind of where I got my foundation in recovery was in that church. What church is that? uh, Southside Assembly. Okay. Yeah. In Jackson. I grew up a block from Southside on Castile Drive, and we went to Southside a good bit as kids based on where it was located. So, yep. uh, Yeah. There's a Boy Scout hut, or was a Boy Scout hut back behind it there. Okay. So, that's where our our troop met and stuff. And there are ball fields right there that bump up to I-2. So, that's that's my old hood there. Okay. South Love hearing about Southside. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, kind of cut my teeth in there on the Bible and the Word. That's the church I got saved in and started this journey with recovery. But my husband wasn't on that journey. Uh, he got diagnosed with a brain tumor in 99, and it was inoperable, cancerous. And they went in and took a biopsy, and it caused a bunch of issues. But uh, God healed him. Um, How long have y'all been married? 23 years. Wow. And, uh, but doctor started doling out because he was the cancer patient and all this stuff started pain pills, pain pills. That's what, that's what it was. And, uh, I'm talking like a lot of narcotics. Let's go on and get him addicted. He's going to die anyway. Right. It ain't going to matter. Right. And, uh, so it just awakened this beast inside of him and, um, he worked in South Jackson too at the time in a really bad area across from Battlefield Park. That's all of South Jackson. Now <laughs> the whole thing. All uh, of Jackson. And so everything was readily available. And um two thousand six I'm clean and sober and uh working at a car dealership in the accounting office, do doing real life. And I get a call from somebody and says hey when y'all gonna pay me that money i said what money he said uh he didn't tell you uh y'all owe, y'all owe, owe me like ten thousand dollars i'm like what <laughs> oh whoa let's, let's stop and and next thing i know we're in a bankruptcy attorney's office and we're filing bankruptcy i right, hold that thought i want to pick up when we left off right there about the bankruptcy and the money and uh, the story's, I, I hate to say, the story's getting good, but the, uh, we're getting into the thick of it. Yeah. This is the Clay Edwards Show. I am joined in the studio this morning on our Testimonial Tuesday by with Robin Mabry, and we'll be right back. She's telling the family's side of the story when it comes to addiction, what the family members have to deal with, what a lot of us have put our family members through, what a lot of you are going through. We're here on the other side of it this morning on Testimonial Tuesday. We'll be right back live in the Mack Hike of Flowood Studios. 
breaking rules when necessary. Welcome back in to the Clay Edwards Show. We're live in the Mack Hike of Flowood Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram Studio. Like I said, man, be sure to get over there up to ten thousand dollars off select new vehicles at Mack Hike of Flowood. Go see Corey McDonald. Tell him Clay Edwards sent you. This segment going to be brought to you by Lakeland Glass and Tent, where quality matters. Located right there on Lakeland Drive and at their new campus and flow on Flowood Drive in Flowood. If you need your automobile windshield replaced, Lakeland Glass and Tent. If you need to get your home, car, or business windows tinted, Lakeland Glass and Tent. They can do it all. They also do vehicle wraps. If you want to change the color of your vehicle or you want to turn it into a rolling billboard, Lakeland Glass and Tent can do that for you too. You got a wall inside your home or business, you want to get something printed on and uh, get your logo on it or a family portrait, anything. It ain't got to just be a business. They can do that too. Give them a call. 601, let me pull my sheet of paper back out. I should know the number by now. 601-946-1000 or check them out online at lakelandglassandtent.com. I want to thank Jason and the team from the bottom of my heart. They've been a day one sponsor of this show. A day one. I, to the best of my knowledge, I think they're the only person that, uh, that, the only sponsor that stayed since day one. We appreciate them. Could not do it without them. They have stood and fought the face of cancel culture with me. And I could not be more appreciative of their friendship and partnership. All right. We're joined in studio this morning by Robin Mabry. She has given us, she's our guest for Testimonial Tuesday. And she has given us the other side of the story when it comes to addiction. The, the side from the family member's perspective that's had to deal with it. And she's had to deal with it generationally through her childhood, through herself, through her child, and, and then through her husband also. And uh, she has stood with the Lord. And she has come out on the other side of it. And um, we had left off at the story where she is finding out her husband has survived cancer or has been going through cancer treatments and has gotten on the other side of that, but has picked up a pain pill addiction along the way. Somebody called her work and said, hey, where's this $10,000 you owe me? Let's pick up there. Yeah, so um, I questioned him about it. He was just like, I made some poor decisions, choices, da 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 Never the, the drugs came up. And and I really believe that as a family, we're family member of an addict. We're we're hopeful, and we we see what we want to see, and we're wrapped up in self. And so we ended up uh, way behind on our bills, and ended up in a bankruptcy attorney's office. And we had been in a car accident. Years prior, 18-wheeler rear-ended us, got a settlement from it, a large settlement, paid off all our debt. Uh, We're sitting really nice, nice upper-middle-class income coming in. No reason for us to be sitting in a bankruptcy attorney's office. And I'm sitting there listening to this bankruptcy attorney, and he's talking, listing off this debt. And I'm sitting there going, what? Like, I mean, it was like being slapped upside the head, like, out of nowhere and I'm like what what just like clueless and in shock and I turn around and I look at my husband and when I look at him it was like the scales were pulled back off my eyes and I could really see what was going on and there sat before me a completely broken strung out drug addict and I was like what is this? <laughs> and we left that attorney's office, and I was like, what is it? And he was like, what are you talking about? I said, no, 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 no. What is it? And he proceeded to tell me, you know, oh, I have got really bad off in this drug addiction. And it escalated from there because then he started going to NA and AA meetings, which... He wasn't an alcoholic. He was a drug addict. He had an opiate problem. And he started using the meetings as an excuse to go get high. <laughs> yeah. And um, I wanted to be hopeful. I wanted to be, give him the benefit of the doubt. You can't give an active addict the benefit of the doubt. Uh, they need help. They need intervention. Um, my story is not everybody's story. It doesn't happen like, I, I didn't know, uh, the reason I was using drugs was because I wanted to bury pain. 
It wasn't because I was an addict. When you're an addict and you like the feeling and you like that thing, it's another beast. And so he um, did that for a while and it culminated for a couple of months and it ended with me holding a loaded gun to his head. And uh, I was really contemplating on shooting him and then shooting me. And just putting you both both of yourselves out of your misery. Right. And uh, <clears throat> that was that was on New Year's Eve in 2006. And uh, some people wouldn't believe this, but I believe it was the Lord. He told me, uh, don't shoot him with it, hit him with it. And I ended up pistol whipping him in our kitchen, knocking him out. Well, I didn't have this on my bingo card for today. Okay. I yes. didn't have this on the bingo card. I, I think new that that's probably the same New Year's Eve. I had an ex hold a hatchet to my throat riding 100 miles an hour through downtown Brandon trying to get pulled over and couldn't find a cop in sight. So, uh, 06, there was something in the water that year. Yeah, it was really it was really a very very traumatic year and so So you, so you pistol whooping? I did. And did the did the police ever get involved in no, that? No, okay, so. no, no, no. God's grace is so good in no, that. No, didn't even catch a domestic. No, good no. stuff. And so I went and hid the gun. Can I while get a hallelujah? He, yes. So I w- went and hid the gun, and uh, he was passed out. He come to, and he was full of rage, and he football tackled me in the living room, and uh, I had carpet burn on my face, and he was missing half a front tooth, and we show up in church the next day. <laughs> Looking like Beth and Rip from uh, Yellowstone. Yes. <laughs> and so we're sneaking in and we're hiding in the back of the back pew where it's not kind of lit. And Pastor Wilson's like, good to see the Mabrys in the house this morning. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> no. So the next day we were in his office and we were just telling him, you know, this is what's going on with us. And he said, you know, have you thought about. Uh, teen challenge and uh, I said look we're paying $425 a week to bankruptcy court you think he's fixing to go take a year's vacation somewhere while I'm left (laughs) hanging the bag you can forget it and so um, I was just like you're you're just gonna have to you know and so it just rock and rolled on and he he got off of that and then um he changed drugs. This is, this is, I've seen this cross addiction thing so often. Uh, whether it, e- even people that get off of drugs, they cross addict to food. What did he cross addict to? So he went to crack. He went from opiates to crack. Because I went from methamphetamine to opiates. Yeah. And then was able to kind of wean myself off that eventually, but. Yeah. So he went to crack and then that culminated into some really bad stuff and i'm not going to go into all the details of that and then how long did that last uh that lasted probably about seven or eight months and some really bad stuff happened and and he just like kind of oh can't i need to get off of that yeah and uh then he went to his doctor and another doctor and they put him on fentanyl patches and <laughs> keep this party going good lord yeah and my, my friend uh, benji died from a fentanyl patch i had prayed to the lord and i just really wanted a divorce i was like i don't i don't i don't have to put up with this like this is just getting just too out there too crazy and and i heard the lord tell me in a just real still small voice that you won't divorce him you'll love him through it and I was like, I do not want to love this man through this, and I'm done. Like, I'm d- stick a fork in me, I'm done. I was sleeping with the enemy. I had to sleep with my car keys down in my bra every night, had all my valuables locked up in my trunk, uh, living in a war zone. Yeah, you use the phrase sleeping with the enemy, and that, that is, I've often used that to describe this very thing. When you're when you're going through, living with somebody going through addiction or going through alcoholism or whatever it is, <clears throat> I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who was in a very volatile situation like that too, and I was explaining to her. I said it's like sleeping with the enemy, literally. Yes, and so uh, I didn't want to be married to him. I was very begrudging about it, and then I was just praying the whole time, like, do something, God, please, just bring him out of it. I don't know what the answer is. 
And so we ended up, I ended up going on the mission field to Africa. And when I came back, it was like God had just dumped out my whole heart, my whole life, my whole everything. And when I came back, I was really, I hated myself. I hated America. I hated all of that because we're so entitled. Like we, we have such entitlement. And so I was dealing with my own stuff and he's just fallen further into this fentanyl thing. Fast forward, 2012. Hold that thought. Okay. Let's take a break real quick. Let's pick up at 2012. Yep. This is the Clay Edwards Show. It's Testimonial Tuesday. It's getting very powerful in here, guys. We've got Robin Mabry telling the perspective of the family member dealing with an addict. We'll be right back on 103.9 WYAB. Breaking rules when necessary. Welcome back into the Clay Edwards Show. We're live here in the Matt Kike of Flowood Studios. This segment is going to be brought to you by Ellis Autoplex. Get out there and see your boy. That is me. I am there every day from 11 to 6. And uh, I would love to sell you a used car or truck or SUV. You can shop us online, ellisautoplex.com. Locally owned, locally operated by Mr. Casey Ellis and his wife, Rachel. we got a great team out there. Jason Weaver, myself. Our two guys in the back, Junior and Tyler, and uh, and we would love to sell you a vehicle. Come out there, see us. Shop us online, twenty one ninety five Highway four seventy one in Brandon, right out there next to Booze Smokehouse. That's Ellis Autoplex. All right, we are doing our testimonial Tuesday. We're knee deep in it. I'm trying to make sure I give Miss Robin here enough time. We got Robin Mabry. She left off at twenty twelve. Yeah, so 2012, um, my husband ends up, my husband and I and my son, we go on a mission trip to Matamoros, Mexico. And uh, my husband seems like he's a little apprehensive about taking fentanyl across the border. Was he prescribed it? Oh, he was. But yeah. he just, he, he for, for whatever reason, didn't want to do it. He was prescribed it. Well, there's plenty across the border, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. So he he fesses up to the people leading the team, and he says, look, I'm leaving all my pain medicine at home. So this joker is detoxing. Oof. 24-hour drive to Matamoros, Mexico, detoxing. We're there a week. He's detoxing off of strong fentanyl opiates. After being on them for how long? A long time. Yeah. Uh, he laid in the bed and just, it, he was sick. He was bad sick. This was his rehab. And I'm like, why? I mean, why now? But it, he just, he just did. And so he was clean for a long time. How long did it take him to detox? That whole week. The whole week. In Mexico? <laughs> in Mexico. <laughs> And, um, just sick. And so we get back and he has this probably two, three year span that he's, he's clean and sober. That's awesome. And, uh, things are going pretty good, but he ha- hadn't dealt with this stuff. He hadn't dealt with this stuff. Like the trauma. Right. And everything that, all of it, like. We weren't dealing with our stuff. He wasn't owning up. It just was like he was uh, what they call a dry drunk, but he was just a dry addict. That's all he, he was just. I haven't, I haven't heard that. Yeah. What is that? That That's where you still have all your junk. You're just not using. Gotcha. And you're miserable. And it's because you haven't dealt with your stuff. So uh, in recovery, that's a well-known term dry dry Dry. drunk dry sober yeah and um dry drunk dry addict so we we um we move forward and he's doing good and then we end up at this little church a little further north of us and um start going into this recovery ministry and our pastor's like, hey, I want to have like kind of staff meetings private with you two. And so I'm like, okay. And he had been counseling my husband through some stuff. And we get into it and my husband relapses. And he relapses and 
now it's methamphetamine. <laughs> and I'm like, he's at the Holy Trinity here, hasn't he? Oh, he's d- he's done opioids, it. crack, and meth. Meth, and then of course the fentanyl patches. But yeah, that's opioid. the meth was the worst though. Um, well, it turns you into a monster. It turns you into a monster, a zombie, a flesh eating monster. I mean, I, and I speak from personal experience. Yeah, and just the rage. Yeah. The rage that comes with it. And I was getting slapped with this rage and I just didn't understand what was going on. And I just felt like things were just not right. And so I, w- I was really done. Like I was ready. I'm just going to divorce. I just can't do another year of this. So where are we at timeline? Uh, this was uh, last year. Okay. Um, I actually drove him to rehab on December 31st of last year, New Year's Eve. Uh, I went and drove him to Mantachi, Mississippi. Never even heard of it. Oh, uh, yeah. Out in the middle of nowhere. It's uh, a little north of Tupelo. Gotcha. And um, so drove him to rehab, and he, um, it's a 30, 60, 90 day program, dual diagnosis, help him deal with his other issues that he has. And he gets up there, and he makes it 26 no, 27 days. And he says, I got to come home. And I'm like, eh, I don't know. He said, my time here's up. And I'm like, what now? This is what a typical person in rehab does. I, I'm well aware, been in it. And so he goes and he does. He comes home and it was just a blessing. It was a blessing from the Lord because my son's, uh, fiance at the time, her mother committed suicide the day after he got home. And so we were dealing with all of that. Mm. You know, you mentioned the, and I hate to interrupt, but you mentioned the coming home early from rehab thing. And that happened with a family member, a close family member this past year. They're supposed to be there for 30 days, but day 25, they found a way to get themselves kicked out of, yeah. of rehab. And it's interesting to hear somebody else tell the story. They came home and were sober for a little while. But eventually, button. Same thing. Same thing. Sober for a little while and then popped a drug test and just like, you're back again. But, um, so we're going through all of that and I'm like, look, you just, we just can't go down this road. You're going to have to, you know, do something. I don't know what the answer is. And I just started praying really, really hard and um, he lost his job. His business closed down, and it shook him. He'd been at the same job for 30 years, and career, identity, everything just came crashing down, and he had to reevaluate. And so uh, it was probably July of of this year, and um, it was a rough two weeks. Uh, but it's like he went to bed. It's the same thing that ha- kind of happened to me. He went to bed one night and he woke up and he hadn't used since. And, uh, he's really embracing. He's having, he's having an open conversation, uh, about his addiction, about, uh, all the, I mean, conversations we never would have had in his active addiction. He's telling me what, what, what his drug dealers were, you know, just all of that. And I'm like, okay, this is sobriety. You know, when they're talking the talk, when they're telling the, when they're telling the tales. Yeah. That there's sobriety there because ain't no way an active addict's going to give you, give the goods. It took me a long time to get comfortable talking about the stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd been sober for seven, eight, nine years. And, and then, uh, you know, even helped start the Celebrate Recovery stuff out at my church and got into talking and having those conversations and realized I wasn't ready and pulled myself out of that situation. Uh, it was another three or four years down the road to where I'm at today, and I was telling you off air that I had to get to where if I was going to do conservative talk radio as a former addict, I probably needed to be the one to tell everybody that didn't know that I was a former addict right. and had gone through all that stuff because the last thing you want is somebody dangling that over your head. You know, oh, I know something about you, you know, and you said you take the take the truth. What was you saying about that? 
Uh, the if, devil. if you tell the truth on yourself, you disarm the devil. Yeah, that's what I had to do. Yeah. And uh, it sounds like that's what he's doing, just telling the truth. Get it all out there. Yeah, and so him and I really have a heart, and we have a call, and we know. And so we're in the process of getting capital together to start up. God's given us so many amazing people in this journey, and we're, we're in the process of trying to— um, open up a drug detox and rehab facility in this area. Um, There really aren't aren't any. They're off and far. And there are, you're a hundred percent right. And uh, that's always something that I know family members or addicts themselves that want to finally have are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And the hardest part is figuring out where to go and how to, to detox, Yeah, you know, and to, to have something here, uh, semi-locally would be a huge thing. Yeah. And that also don't cost $100,000, $60,000, whatever it is. Right. These ridiculous amounts of money. But um, see what, let's, let's stop there, come back. We'll land the plane with a couple minutes left here yeah. at the end of the hour. This is the Clay Edwards Show. Join in studio for Testimonial Tuesday with Robin Mabry. We'll be right back in the Mack Hike of Flowood Studios. Breaking rules when necessary. Welcome back into the Clay Edwards Show. I'm going to save any ad reads for the rest of the week. And we got about three minutes left here with Miss Robin Mabry. During the break, uh, leading into the break, she said that uh, they have been led to start their own uh, detox and treatment facility here in Mississippi. And I think that is amazing because one of the things I hear about all the time is people having to go off. And don't get me wrong, there are treatment facilities here. They're not necessarily detox facilities. And I, I, I like what you're doing. You know, you told me some stuff off the air, and I'll let you save that. You can talk about it if you want. How would you like to end this today? Well, um, but when we started it, I just hope that what you hear from me is a hope that doesn't give up. It doesn't let go. And... We can identify people as crack addicts. We can identify people as uh, drunks. We can identify people as uh, meth heads, tweakers. I mean, we know all the names, but when it boils down to it, we're human beings. And we all have, we're mamas, we're daughters we're sisters we're aunts we're uncles we're fathers we're brothers whatever whatever it is we're humans and uh the world wants to title us because of the things that we do um and not who we really are and um we no matter what substance we may be trying to lean on cope with we all have uh some of us better than others coping skills And some coping skills are very destructive. And uh, if we could look at people beyond uh, a name, a label, and just see that we all want the basic thing, and that's to be loved and accepted. Um, I found that with my husband, as I loved him and I accepted him as a struggling man, that didn't know how to deal or cope with his feelings and his emotions and his things, I was able to get past what he was doing and actually love that hurting person inside that just wanted to be accepted and loved and understood. Robin, I pre- we're out of time. <clears throat> we're out of time. I appreciate you. We'll pick this back up. The podcast will be available shortly. Y'all please go share that. When you see it, and I'll be back here tomorrow. Uh, looks like we got Mike Madison up next. This is WYB. This is the Clay Edwards Show. Thanks for listening. Tune in tomorrow at 7 a.m. as the Clay Edwards Show discusses all that is going on in and around the city of Jackson. This concludes our broadcast day. Right here on 103.9 WYAB.